Welcome to Calvary Life. This is the podcast for the membership of Calvary Baptist Church and also anybody else out there that's interested in local church life. And I'm Charles. Hey, I'm Paul. We've got a special guest with us today. So this is a name that a lot of Calvary folks will know because you have prayed for him and for his family. And uh, though you have not met him, you get an opportunity to and uh, through this podcast. And so I want to introduce our special guest. Guillermo, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you know your family and 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 that sort of thing, and then we want, we just want to talk to you about your journey, your your personal journey from Cuba to the U.S., and you know your work, stuff you've done in Cuba, um, how you serve the Lord there, and your church, and just all those kind of things. So I want our folks to get to know you a little bit better and how they can be praying, not just for your family, but Christians in general and for conditions in general, because I would say a lot of our folks really would have no idea what things are like there. Uh, for a family like yours. So, Guillermo, introduce your, tell us about your family and, and yourself just a little bit. Okay, uh, good morning. First of all, I want to apologize in advance because of my English is not as good as it should be in order to communicate as I would like to, but this is what I got, so uh, <laughs> here I go. So, my name is Guillermo Piedra. Uh, I'm 51 years old. I've been uh, living in Cuba uh, all my entire life, so uh, there I uh, uh, I came to the knowledge of the Lord at the age of 24, and since then I was always involved in the church, my local church there in Patraga, so there I met my wife, uh, a, a very beautiful young lady who uh, eventually became my wife, of course, and we started a whole family. Um, right now I have three kids, my son Israel, who is the oldest one, he's 19 years old, he's right here with me. Then I have a middle son, 14 years old, uh, who is back in Florida right now, um, high school. And then I have uh, the little um, a girl who is uh, almost two years old. Uh, it was a... Uh, 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 I would say that the last shot I had. So, uh, thanks God because uh, He is uh, um, merciful. Um, he allowed me after many, many obstacles and difficulties to make all my way through and got to this country, which is, in my opinion, uh, amazing. Uh, as, in, as far as I get to see until now. So, a little bit about my journey with the Lord. Uh, as I said before, I was uh, saved at the age of 24. Years old, so I was in college uh, by that time. I used to um, go to the law school, which I never finished. And then, as soon as I got to the local church in Parraga, as I said before, I got. Is that your neighborhood? Where you're yeah, that's the name. That's the name of my neighborhood. Uh, it's a a pretty rough uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's located in the outskirts of the city. Um, uh, there, it's a it's a, a medium sized church. Uh, right now, so by the time I started, we were like at 20 or 30 members right there, but it's been on the growth uh, for a while, so um, I started my ministry there as a local teacher in that teeny tiny church, and eventually I started, um, I received this invitation on the uh, from the part of my pastor there because they started this ministry as part of the Western Baptist Convention that my church was part of it. And I was invited to be and work as interpreter uh, in the uh, Department of Voluntary uh, Workers that uh, they were coming from the states to work over the churches um, on the western part of the island. And that was my work for the last uh, 22 years. So there uh, we received many, many uh, brothers from abroad, and we mainly we came at first uh, to work in the construction of new buildings and um, uh, repairing sanctuary buildings and pastors' houses too because for the last uh, 50 years it were, they all were in so bad conditions because the government did not allow uh, all the proper, uh, those properties to be renewed or repaired. So there was a big need for those buildings uh, to be repairing or then the congregation be, being able and gather in there. So we were doing um, so, at least that was the excuse, because what uh, the main purpose uh, it was uh, uh, really about all the time was about spreading the gospel. Yeah. So they came, they were allowed to go to Cuba under the excuse of being helping uh, rebuilding sanctuary buildings. But uh, in the other side, which was kind of hidden, was the intention to spread and helping to spread to the local people with resources and even from uh, uh, by by going uh, from house to house to preach the gospel, to spread mm-hmm. God's word uh, 
um, in towns because uh, for so many years that was very uh, highly prohibited prohibited and persecuted uh, on the island, as you uh, many of you might know or not, I don't know. Uh, we've been under this um, uh, uh, total, totalitarist uh, uh, regime in Cuba uh, for so many years. Um, and, uh, it, this, the God was taken away from the schools and it was prohibited, uh, all kind of religious stuff and all that. And it was only all about uh, humanism and that kind of philosophies and currents that it was very interested the government about as part of their policy to spread their uh, system. Yeah, I uh, remember when we first started going, that's what I, and I was explaining this to one of our people a little while ago that our trips, our mission projects in Cuba were always based on a, a construction project. That was the premise, like you're talking about. So we'd go in and do the work, but at night or in the afternoons or whenever we had opportunity, preaching, teaching, training, spending time with people. But the only way we could get access in, the only way that the Cuban government would allow us in is if we had an approved work project. Yes, uh, I mean, the, the condition of our sanctuaries and um, the introduction of a new uh, policy of our uh, government to bring up the um, public opinion about how open they were about religion, um, it opened up the uh, possibility of many of the brothers to come from the states. Um, I'm helping the Cuban, the local Cuban by uh, materials, uh, ways, and also by instruction to go th further in the spreading the gospel all over the town, the small towns, and um, villages, and areas that never before heard uh, God's word. So it was back in the early 90s where uh, we were in a very economical crisis there in Cuba that we started having this revival. Um, many brothers from many parts of not only the United States but around the world, they, uh, uh, they were added to this um, task to spread the gospel. So we had so many missionaries come, coming from all over the world, from Canada, from even from Latin American countries, and from even from Europe. The, Europe they were coming over uh, the island, Cuba, to spread the gospel. It seems uh, they were allowed, uh, not directly, but still they have a fairly chance to go out and preach the gospel. So that was the my case in my, my hometown that I had the chance to go out uh, as a member of my church, my local church, and also a member of the uh, Western Cuban Baptist Convention and them as interpreter for the American team that they came all the way from the States to uh, Cuba to do so. So it's been like that for many, many years. Um, the, the gospel has spread all over the island as fire. And so we have been living a revival for many, many years. I would say right now it's kind of slowing down because uh, it's part of God's plans above everything and also because some particular conditions that, uh, that became obstacles in order to be able to um, spread out loud the gospel. But that's something that still is under God's control. Is it getting harder, you're saying? Yeah, it is getting harder and harder. I mean, uh, for outsiders to come in and do this, or? I would say I would say that it's uh, harder and harder because people they are really in despair, and because of the economical conditions and the situation that they are living in Cuba. So I would say, uh, according to my own personal experience, that it's not growing as it used to do back in the early 90s, um, I mean, yeah, early 90s, um, 2000s, but it still is growing very fast if you compare it to some other missionary yeah. fields. I remember when we were going there, I don't, I don't remember the year our first trip was, but what, it was 2000s, you know, early 2000s, and, but we were not allowed to bring in, like, economic aid. You know, like, we couldn't bring in, you couldn't bring in things for all the church you could give, you know, all these gifts out and things like that, that, you know, we weren't allowed to do that. So are any of these groups now, like people are struggling financially and are they able to bring in things for the church and say, you know, we have all these things to help meet physical needs or st still that difficult? 
Yeah, it still is uh, a little bit difficult. I remember that uh, still we live under the same kind of government. Uh, they don't really like us to spread God's word, of course, because they are an enemy of the truth. But seems uh, they want to give that a political um, a right impression that that, that they it's are open. Op- it's open and they are uh, receiving all kind of of. Um, outside philosophies and all that uh, they are still willing but they don't do it in the right mood so um, whenever you have the chance to go down there to cuba and being able to spread god's uh, uh word down there you have to make you have to have always be clear 100 percent that you are doing something that the uh, authorities disagree with so you have to be very careful. You, it's always my suggestion to follow the direction of the local people in charge, uh, just making sure that you don't make mistakes and that uh, you are going to be doing it in the right way in the certain conditions where it won't cause any hurt to the local church. Yeah, we talked about that with teams that went, that worst thing that's going to happen to us over there as Americans is we'll be asked to leave. But then we're going to leave a lot of problems behind for that pastor, for that congregation, if we don't do things the right way. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your, you know, your your personal story, your family story of of coming out, because um, some people listening will will know that we've prayed for you. We prayed for you as a church. Um, there are people in church that have been financially supportive to help with some things. So tell us just a little bit about your story, because I know it's been. It's, it's been tough. It was tough getting out, and you had some obstacles and things. And how many weeks have you guys, have you had the whole family together now? Yeah, we have the whole family. Um, like four weeks? Together. Six weeks? Yeah, six weeks. So I first got here six uh, uh, weeks ago, and then the rest of them, my wife, my oldest, and my youngest daughter, they came like uh, three three weeks ago. But first of all, I want to thank so, uh, all those who took part in the prayer, uh, in our sitting for me and my family in order to be able to um, come here. Um, yeah, it, it, it was very difficult uh, to the situation that we all were living there. So I got to the point where I had to make the probably one of the hardest decisions I had to make in my entire life, that it was to leave behind my local church. And even some of my relatives, like my mom, that, who have still stay there, in order to be here and survive and provide for the rest of my family, my kids, and, and my wife and myself. And it, it's been very difficult, hard way. Not that the Lord is out of control. On the contrary, he's been using all that hardship and difficult difficulties in order to grow me uh, as a Christian and as a believer and um, become the kind of man that I am right now, thanks to the, all those uh, uh, obstacles that we have to face in our lives as Christians. Of course, since we are Christian, we have a very different perspective of the whole situation, but it still have been very difficult to the point that I was at risk of, 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 of losing my freedom. Uh, but God had been in control all the time, so I was accused of using uh, like like a, 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 a fa- false documentation that was that case was dismissed. I was able finally to to uh, be vindicated in front of the Cuban authorities, and eventually, uh, uh, not long ago, a year and a half ago, less than a year and a half ago, we had President Biden extending, granting the opportunity for those who were in need, um, um, wanted to come over the uh, United States to receive the humanitarian parole. So I was so one of them. So that's the official status, humanitarian parole. Yeah, that's my official status right now. So I'm here I'm working on my papers, which is uh, something that is, uh, is going very fast, to tell the truth, and still some more paperwork on, um, on process. But that's, uh, it took us, once we apply for the humanitarian parole, it took us like one year and one month of wait in order to, be, to receive the, the uh, traveling permit and come over uh, the States. Right now I'm um, living uh, temporarily on, on Florida until I receive uh, uh, the conclusion of all of my case. And so tell us a little bit about the, some of those details in there, like with your sons, one who was you're trying to get out before he began his military service, and then Israel had to start military service, and then after those two years, and then now you have another son that you're trying to get out before he has to start his military service, and just all these all these details and how they fit together. Yeah, we can say that God works on mysterious ways. So, um, I, 
two years ago, my uh, uh, son, my oldest son, whom uh, uh, right now he's 19 years old, he was about to go to the military uh, in Cuba. By the way, the, the military service, that's what they call it, is mandatory for kids, um, more or less for two years, when they turn 18. But they are regulated at the age of 15. By being regulated, I mean that they are not supposed to leave the country or to have a passport or to uh, do some kind of activities that implies that they are going to, they probably leave the country. So uh, I was in despair. That was the time that I was trying to leave uh, the country, um, but the Lord, the Lord made, did, did not make it possible. So my my um, oldest son finally had to go to the military, um, and then my youngest, my middle son, he was about to turn 15. So I was in a predicament. So uh, because uh, by the time that my my oldest son got into the military, I received the permit to travel, to come to the United States. So I have this predicament. So what was I going to do? Because I have one son in the military that was not going to be released until they decided when. And at the same time, I was in the expiring limit frame of time that my middle son was going to be regulated. And then I would have to wait like two years in order to leave the country. But there is a time of expiring, a, a limited time for me to leave the country under the humanitarian part all. So I had to make a decision. I had to make it very fast. So uh, after doing a lot of paperwork, they, uh, the government, the Cuban government, decided that they were going to leave my oldest son free from the military. But still they had to accomplish a, a certain number of paperwork. But I was running the, out of time about my uh, middle son and uh, recruiting. You had to feel all kinds of pressure and stress during this oh, yeah. that I, two year period. I would say that uh, I, uh, I had to, to uh, I have probably one of the most difficult uh, years that I ever had in my entire life, this last year I had. So, and then plus bringing a, a, I mean, a baby in. I mean, yeah, little then, girls. Yeah, I, mean, we, we, I had a... Not even two years old yet. Yeah. Uh, 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 this, I received like um, 21 months ago, I received this gift uh, from the Lord, which is a, a, the sweetest girl in the world, and uh, I did not expect her to come at all. So... But it's, it is well received, and, and of course, it's part of this. Uh, I wouldn't say adventure, but uh, it is, without any doubt, a very important uh, a part of this quest that the Lord allow us to be through. Yeah, they had to magnify the need, right? Because oh. now you're thinking, how do, how do I take care of her? And and maybe I, I know it's a long subject, Guillermo, but give everybody a little sense of just like the conditions. I mean, I. I'm sure most people wouldn't have any idea. You know, what is it actually like? You know, a young family there living in busy city of Havana. I mean, what are the conditions like trying to trying to bring up a family there? Yeah, provide uh, for a family. Yeah, you know, I would say that the first of all, as a Christians, I have a very different perspective uh, because I, I can tell that there is a, there is a, a purpose for all what happens in our lives. So that gives us hope. And our faith keeps us alive to take one more step every morning. So at the same time, I can tell that most of my Cuban fellow country people, they do not share my faith. And you can tell that by the economic experiences and the social environment that we are living right now in Cuba, my people is in despair. I mean, the criminality, the rate of, of crime has been raised, like I've, I would say, like 10 times in the last three or four years. Uh, it got uh, very, very bad in some areas. The drugs is rampant, and the, uh, I would say that the highest percentage of alcoholism has been in, uh, increasing in the last uh, two or three years or so, because people don't have hope. And people is suffering and struggling for the basic things like food, like clothes. The transportation, it's, it's right now on a, on a stage that is uh, almost absent. 
So people have to walk. Because they don't have the resources to fuel the buses. and That's it. So well, the main transportation mem in Cuba is public. So under conditions, because of the uh, mechanical state of the vehicles and also the amount available, it's very limited. Um, it's, people have to walk like locked in order to get to the places where they need to. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the churches. I mean, I, I think this would be something that would be super helpful for our folks to understand, because I really think there's a biblical picture of church life that you all were experiencing there that is probably not so typical for us to experience here, and how uh, Christians took care of each other, support each other, pray for each other. I mean, tell us a little bit about like your church and the sort of community that you had, and and how that's how that really encouraged everybody, gave life, buoyed everybody that's in that fellowship. Yeah, the church in Cuba, I would say that is very very healthy um, in many respects. So uh, it's fulfilling its uh, 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 reason. It's accomplishing the goals, it's still growing in number, and is offering a peace and hope and faith to the community. I mean, it seems uh, uh, even right now, even when we are not growing that fast, it still is growing to a very high rate. And, and you can tell that are, they are very alive the church in Cuba the Christian church in Cuba is very alive um, you can tell that every Sunday or oh, how crowded it gets I mean people is coming in coming in especially young people is coming to our churches which is uh, the solution I mean not only for Cuba but here too but what happens when the uh, we have all this economical situation is that people, understands that the rest of the idols are lies. So it is very clear for people where is the source of the living hope. And it's more obvious. I mean, it's evident. It's like the light that shines brighter in the darkness. And, and that's what happened in our churches. I'm so glad to get to see Cuban churches full of people and being very committed people who is living Christian life with all the human defects, with all the human struggles, but still growing and fighting the good fight. And it's amazing to me that though the official position of the government for seven decades has been atheism, anti-church, anti-Christian, the church is not stopped. Gates of hell don't prevail against it. Yeah, it's, you know, I have learned... Uh, in these years uh, as a Christian, that, uh, that the hardest it gets in terms of social environment, the fastest the church spreads all over. Like uh, in the biblical times, we need church, we need God to survive, and that's very evident in Cuba. Um, it's something that really, really uh, I miss about my church right now. It's something that it grew up as part of my identity as Christian, as Cuban Christian. I mean, it's something that I am looking forward to find here in the United States. And let me tell you, God is going to do whatever it takes in order to keep the church faithful and make obvious and evident uh, who is who in Christian church? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I thought that was a pretty powerful statement. I don't know if people caught that early on, and you said that to me before. You know, one of the hard parts of leaving wasn't just leaving where you were born and grew up and those sort of things, but leaving your church. You know, I just wonder sometimes, think about that in American context, how many people see their church as such an integral part of their life. This is my family. These are the people that God has given me, and that I have responsibility for, and they take responsibility for me, and we love each other and care for each other. You know that real sense of identity. Um, I, I think we, I think we lack sometimes. So, Guillermo, give us a, a quick thought before we wrap up. Kind of, what are your thoughts moving from here? I know you guys are still just trying to get you trying to get settled and things figured out and legal things done and paperwork and that sort of thing. But now that you're here and you've got your whole family here, kind of, what are your thoughts moving forward? Well, uh, right now, um, I would say, um, right now I'm trying to get rid of this, as I said before, this uh, sensory overload. It's, it's <laughs> something strange. That I guess this is the first time that I experienced this because this country is so different 
from what all what I know that this morning I was trying to start a, a little bitty car, the a golf cart. <laughs> the Paul gave me the chance to drive him. Uh, it's so different to all what I have uh, known before that it was impossible for me. So I. I took the best way that I know to transport myself, that is walking. So I came walking from <laughs> Paul's, house, Paul's house to, to the church. So, but from now on, it's all about uh, doing my very best to do the only thing that I know to do the best after worshiping my God that is supporting for me and my family. And I don't know what it is going to take. I don't know if I'm ready or not, if I... I have the tools or not. All I know is that I'm willing. I'm, I'm not afraid because I'm, I know that God is with me, Emmanuel, and here I am to serve. How can we pray for you and your family? Tell oh. us a few things that we can be praying for you, you all about. Okay, we, we, we need your praise. Uh, we live on praying. I, I am fed by prayers. So if there is one thing that I would like you to pray about for me and my family— is for God to give us the minimum uh, sanity to make the right choices as we stay here in your country and on earth. I still have the need to be a gathering man as I provide for my family. That's the way I was, uh, uh, in, that it was intended for me to do it from the beginning. And that's something that I... I had to accomplish until the very last day of my life. Yeah. Well, we'll be praying for your, for your kids as they settle and, and your wife and just everybody making those adjustments and that, that God will keep blessing. But really, I wanted you to be here on our podcast. I wanted people to know that you're here. You know, we folks have prayed for you and, and people know maybe bits and pieces of your story and, and this is a challenge of coming. And, and again, any of us who haven't experienced it, lived it, wouldn't know the challenges and difficulties of just you know just day to day. How am I going to take care of things? How am I going to get things that I need? Um, how am I going to provide the things I need for my family? I, I know like for Cecilia and her two aunts that still live in Cuba, you know we hear on a pretty regular basis at least once a week of their struggles and difficulties of being elderly people there, and you know how do you survive? How do you how do you get just the basic necessities and those kind of things? And for you in a busy urban center like Havana with a young family, that's a whole different kind of challenge. And so we're thrilled that you're here and God's answer those prayers to get you here. And we're just going to keep praying that, that God provides and that um, you find good ministry and work opportunities and everything here to use the gifts God's given you. Yeah, and I got I got one question before we stop, and that's that's to ask about Pastor Paul. Tell us about you getting to know him and and your relationship with him uh, when he came to Cuba. Oh, uh, it was a very peculiar situation. Seems uh, <laughs> Pastor Paul Thompson, uh, uh, is is such a good character. I mean, he, he stands out from many many other pastors that I know. Not only because of uh, his crazy eyes look. <laughs> but also because he had some relatives and families that they were expecting for him back in the airports, uh, which is not typical for an uh, 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 American pastor going yeah. to Cuba. So <laughs> that, was, uh, that was something that really spoke out loud about his feeling and relationship with the Cubans. So that was something that up to this day, I mean, it had made out of our, our relationship the kind of relationship we have. So he, he has a great heart for the Cubans. He even married a Cuban. <laughs> so uh, we were part of so many adventures there in Cuba, spreading the gospel, going to very uh, uh, apart places and digging holes and putting on footage for foundations and, and being in so wet, hot, terrible places. And we always were uh, uh, surrounded by jokes, uh, good mood, and most um, any other theme, uh, the preaching of God's word all over where we went. Of course, there are a couple of, of um, account that I would say, but I, I need permission to. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good time. I, you know, every single time I was there, man, I, I hated to leave. I, I missed you guys, miss, you know, saying goodbye to you and Joel and, you know, the other guys that were there. It's just, it was always, always hard to do, but, um, and we had, we had some good experiences there, some good, good times. Good. And I think we did some good things. I hope we did some good things, encouraged some pastors and taught some things and built some things and, Saw some things, and I, and I hope God was pleased. I hope there's good fruit um, for those long term. But man, it's a it's been a long time now. So I've probably known you for it's over twenty years. Yeah, 
Mono less. Yeah, you were a young man back then. Now, yeah, now I'm you're, a, this, now I'm you're a, this old a, guy with a two-year-old. <laughs> you're gonna be the oldest guy at high school graduation. <laughs> <laughs> if I get there, so I, I back in that day, I have even all my teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's right, well, man. We're super glad you're here. Glad you can spend a few Thank days you. with us here in Dothan, and we'll show him around Dothan's finest. Um, you know, while we're here, but. Please, if you're listening, um, just continue to pray for them. And if you ever want more information, you know, Guillermo and I stay in touch. We talk, we we text, that sort of thing. So, um, if you ever want some updates, want to know how things are going, please just hit me up, and I'll I'll fill you in on on what's new. And uh, soon, soon once things get settled a little bit, dust gets settled for them, I'm sure we'll we'll have some time where they'll family will be back, and you guys can meet uh, you guys can meet Guillermo and his family on a Sunday, and and that sort of thing. Very yeah. good. That sounds good to me. Well, thanks for coming and, and giving us a few minutes and joining us for our podcast. My pleasure. All right. So we are um, uh, happy to take any questions from you, folks out there that are listening. If you'll just send us an email at podcast at calvarydothan.com, we'd love to answer your questions uh, at our next podcast or two. So do that. And uh, remember, we're for God, for Dothan, and for the world. Yeah.